Hello everybody, I'm George from Ireland, so welcome back to the English Law Channel. Um, I'm looking at proprietary estoppel now. So if you've uh, looked at um, the contract law, um, then you'll have some idea what this is to do with promissory estoppel. So that's why you, you always do contract before you get on to land law. So land law, property law, same thing. Um, okay, so this doctrine uh, operates in um, two stages. The initial one is the claimant must demonstrate that estoppel is there. Um, so the claimant there has to prove that, uh, three things really, that the defendant made a certain representation. The next thing he has to prove is that the claimant relied on that representation and the third party is it relied on it to his detriment. But yeah, so I said, um, has to demonstrate that there's a representation. Okay, so uh, the claimant also needs to uh, convince the court of the unconscionability of the defendant's behaviour. So the representation is a statement or some action, it could be written or spoken as a statement, uh, it could be just once, it could be a, a course of behaviour over many years. Um, okay, that the, the claimant was going to um, gain some uh, rights in property and that's an impression that could be formed over a very long period of time or it could be just from one statement so far, as long as there's sufficient clarity about that. So um, anyway, so the defendant knows that the claimant has formed the impression that, it, that there'll be the acquirement of, of proprietary rights by the, the defendant. Gillerton Holt is a case about that in 2001. So the detriment could be about paying money, uh, like consideration in contract law, or anything else of value, um, any property, any services and so forth, any forbearance, any disbenefit, which would be uh, suffered by the, the, the um, uh, claimant. Or it could be something personal, like the claimant um, moving house or putting his children in a different school. And this is all on the faith of a promise about a new new home being given. Grant and Edwards 1986 was about this, although Coombs and Smith 1986 contradicts it from the same case. Or sent it from the same year, sorry. Okay, so first of all, um, showing that uh, Restopolis is present. And the second stage is uh, the remedy that the courts award. And this the, the, it could be remedied pecuniarily. So the claimant um, doesn't gain property rights straight away just because there's been, um, there's been this um, uh, promise and then reliance onto one's detriment and blah, blah, blah. The court is, needs to grant um, whatever they consider just having regard to all the circumstances. It might be property rights and it might just be some uh, reparatory payment. Um, but the uh, it's it's not clear on what grounds the course the court's going to make this ruling. So um, anyway, it could be saying you got to you got to fulfil your promise um, because you have to pay, make a compensatory payment as the claimant relied on this to his or her disadvantage. We, we must prevent the claimant being treated unjustly. So sometimes the claimant's been awarded freehold, and that was fulfilling a promise in Pasco and Turner. 1979, or it could be a sum of monies, Campbell and Griffin 2001, or it could be both monies and property, as in Gillette and Holt. So proprietary estoppel is, of course, equitable, and as you know, equitable doctrines are discretionary, well, the remedies, really. Um, so uh, you should look at the, the Modern Law of Estoppel, a book about that by Oxford University Press, came out in the year of the millennium, warmly recommended to you. So equitable estoppel. So proprietary estoppel um, is, is up to the court whether they're going to do so, what they're going to do about this, they have to have to reach a result which does not offend against conscience. So anyway, so we'll see about establishing the equity or the equitable right. So a locus classicus for this one is Lord Kingsdown's dissenting speech in Ramsden and Dyson, 1866. Forgive me if I quote it at some length. If a man, under verbal agreement with a landlord for a certain interest of land, or what amounts to the same thing, under an expectation created or encouraged by the landlord, that he shall have a certain interest, takes possession of the land with the consent of the landlord, and upon the faith of such promise or expectation, with the knowledge of the landlord and without objection by him, uh, lays out money on the land, the court of equity will compel the landlord to give effect to such a promise or expectation. So this, this dictum by, by um, Lord Kingsdown is often cited with approbation, but um, the... Uh, the range of this doctrine um, has um, been broadened in recent decades. So if the owner of the land um, willfully uh, um, encourages another person to act or um, permits the other person to act, even mutely permits it, the other person acting to his detriment um, on the basis that this other person, the claimant, is going to um, gain an interest in land, then that owner who encouraged or allowed this reliance would be a stopped from um, 
uh, asserting his um, strict legal rights. Um, OK, and they might indeed be obliged to grant equity. Equity might have arisen in favour of the claimant in this case. So remember, we've got to have representation. We have to have a reliance upon that representation. Someone perhaps changed his situation because he believed in that representation. And remember, that reliance or that change of position has to be to the disadvantage um, of the claimant. He might have spent money. Um, or he might have suffered some loss as a result of what he's doing. He might have given up a lucrative job opportunity or business opportunity or something. And last of all, the unconscionability of permitting um, the, uh, the person who's made the statement, the representor, to uh, renege on that promise. Because um, looking at the situation in the round, it would uh, go against conscience. It just wouldn't be right for the promiser to be able to um, break his promise and get away with it. So, but there are certain issues to be borne in mind. So the doctrine um, is applicable where the owner was it, it was um, unaware of the true legal situation. At the time, he encouraged the other person to behave in a certain way. The issue here is, is whether it'd be conscionable allow, to allow this person to uphold um, his or her um, legal rights. Taylor Fashions Limited against Vic Liverpool Victoria Trustees Company Limited, 1982. Okay, and actually there's Mathara and Mathara in 1994. In that case, the claimant one, even though the owner doesn't seem to have realised that um, the, any promise, um, have made any promise or representation encouraging um, the, the, the claimant to believe what she believed. So I don't really understand how that case works. Um, notwithstanding, in previous cases, the claimant usually had um, expended uh, money on the land. It is enough these days if he or she has experienced some disadvantage arising from doing something or indeed refraining from doing something. So the courts um, look at the situation in the round, as I said, and they um, uh, interpret the notion of detriment broadly. The Court of Appeal found that if representation is made, there's a presumption which can be rebutted that the claimant has acted in reliance on it. So it um, behoves a defendant to prove to the contrary, and that was found in Greasley and Cook, 1980. The majority of cases of representation um, is about a certain piece of land, and the claimant has an existing interest in it. But the court in Ray Bash in 1986, in this case, the claimant lived in her own house, and it was quite away from the deceased's house in that case. Um, so the, the court said um, they weren't going to enforce a doctrine narrowly in this case. So you see how the law has a certain elasticity. It's always evolving. So in Ray Basham and also Wedding against Jones 1993, the doctrine was applicable in a situation where one person encouraged another person to act to um, his or her detriment, that she would inherit lots of property on the other person's decease. And this approach was then upheld by the House of Lords in Thorner against Major 2009, not John Major, the Prime Minister. Sorry, why do I have such an itchy snout all of a sudden? Um, Gillard and Holt 2001 and Jennings and Rice 2002. Here it was obvious that the courts were um, uh, adopting a more uh, a holistic approach because they were looking at proprietary estoppel and looking at the cases um, having regard to the whole situation. Um, and they were, then they were going to decide whether there, were, there was estoppel equity and then how the situation should be rectified. So um, you must demonstrate that something was unconscionable and that really is at the core of, 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 of a proprietary estoppel. So let's look at the um, remedies available to courts. So um, if equity has been found, uh, how is the court going to effectuate it? So looking at the cases, there is, um, there's uh, all sorts of remedies that can be awarded, um, and that will be enough for proprietary estoppel. And these can be just paying money, can be granting a license or a lease or freehold. Dodsworth and Dodsworth, 1973, Burroughs and Burroughs against Sharp, 1991. These are cases where someone spent money and it was the, the right remedy here was, was giving the money back, especially sometimes it would be um, impractical to have the two parties live together which they hate each other's guts. Crab against Aaron District Council, 1976. Chowdhury and Yavuz, 19, 2011. The rights of access or rights of way were granted as a remedy. In Griffiths and Williams, 1977, a non-assignable lease for life was granted. Sometimes there have been cases where courts have found that equity has arisen in the claimant's favour um, and this can only be satisfied by giving the fee simple to that person. Dilwyn and Llewellyn, 1862, or Pascoe and Turner, 1979. Thorner and Major, 2009, which went to the UK House of Lords just before it turned into the Supreme Court. Right, at the opposite end of the range, there are, um, there are other possible results. And a, and, a, and a remedial action that could be granted by the court um, could be denied if they said that the claimant has um, gained some benefit 
and then they this exhausted the detriment. So they're not in, in the end they actually haven't suffered. They did make some detriment, but they got some advantage. So the the sum total of that is zero. So they don't need to get any more compensation. Um, Sledmore and Dorby, nineteen ninety six was a case about that. So it seems that there are two different approaches to this. The courts have said we can we can figure out the right remedy by looking at two different approaches. So uh, how can they affect the reasonable expectations? Sometimes courts have said said you know we've got um, really um, unlimited, unfettered discretion in in how to remedy the situation. But now it seems that the courts are um, merging the two approaches. They're looking at what the claimant expects to get. And there's the proportionality is obviously uh, central to this um, and looking at the detriment that they were suffered by the claimant. So there's expectation, there's detriment. These are two different measures of remedy that should be granted. In Jennings and Rice, the court said that um, both approaches were valid um, and sometimes it's not right to give one remedy simply on the basis of the, the claimant's expectations. Um, but the court cannot have unlimited discretion. So Lord George Justice Walker said it cannot be doubted that in this as in every other area of law, the court must take a principled approach and cannot exercise completely unfettered discretion according to the individual judge's notion of what is fair in a particular case. Close quotation. So the judges can't be too wild. They've got to be a bit conventional and see what the general judicial thinking is because the idiosyncrasies of judges could produce um, wildly discrepant uh, results in cases with a very similar factual basis. So, um, uh, anyway, an interest expected by a claimant um, is, is something that is pertinent to, to, to have regard to. So the court must um, strive to be just and they must make sure that there is a proportionality between the remedy um, granted and the detriment that was suffered. So if estoppel uh, equity has been generated and this is what was found, the value of the equity will depend upon all the circumstances, including the expectations and the detriment. The most essential requirement is there must be proportionality between the expectations and the detriment. So you might have suffered this much detriment but have an expectation of this much, and so the remedy granted might be something in between. All right, so the approach is um, to give the minimum equity to do justice, so bearing in mind the facts of whatever case you're facing, like Sledmore or Dorby, um, which might be nout. Um, it could be a mix in between expectation and, uh, and rely and sorry, not reliance, and detriment. Dillard and Holt is a case in point. So this um, balanced approach um, shows how much discretion there is you can award um, some financial uh, compensation. Property rights can be granted. Um, whatever they think is, is right to sac satisfy equity in this case. So um, sometimes they say we really need to separate the parties. They can't bear to live together, like in Guest and Guest 2020, or Davis and Davis 20, 2016 was a case like that. If the expectation is unclear and the detriment was incurred over a very long period, the claimant would probably get an expectation-based remedy. But if the opposite way around, if the representation was unclear and detriment has not been suffered, like Haberfield and Haberfield 2019. Um, Anyway, so it's, it's, we're really unsure what to do if there's a contractual license. Like we rely on this in a stopple, um, like 1983, um, it suggests so, but Briggs um, in 1981 would suggest otherwise. So this area is very much in flux, and there's a lot of case law on this one. So there are many cases um, which show these principles, and there are cases which demonstrate how these principles are forever evolving. So there are a number of questions to be considered about uh, interests which um, arise from estoppel. Um, so I'll go through some of the cases in a later video. Toodaloo.